Hello, I'm Dr. Mark Hyman. Welcome to The Doctor's Pharmacy. That's F-A-R-M-A-C-Y, a place for conversations to matter. And today's conversation with Chef Marco is going to be one that really matters and will blow your mind because it's a whole different way of thinking about food and cooking and the meaning of food. It's pretty awesome. Now, Marco is a chef. He's a restaurateur. He's a cookbook author. Marco Canora promotes delicious, simple, healthful food. He opened in 2003 something called Hearth. It's a restaurant in the East Village of Manhattan, which I've been to many times because it's so darn good. He has a local following. He's been uh, really been promoted all over. He's, he's a two-star review from the New York Times. He's got the prestigious Outstanding Restaurant nomination from the James Beard Foundation. And in 2017, Marco won the James Beard Foundation Award for the best chef in New York. That is no easy feat considering how many unbelievable restaurants there are here. He's also the founder of Brodo. And this is something you better pay attention to, which is a bone broth company, a popular to-go window serving coffee cups, not of coffee, but hot, nourishing, organic, grass-fed, Bone broth. Now, Mark and his team opened Brodo Window in Soho, which is near the East Village, last spring, and just opened their fourth Brodo on the Upper West Side, and I've been there. It's awesome. For a total of two windows, two shops. Now, Brodo, along with the recipes in a good food day, reflect his renewed attention to his health and wellness, uh, and you can check out that story in the introduction in the book. Now, his first book, his first cookbook was Salt to Taste, which is pretty awesome. It was a major success and nominated for the James Beard Award in 2010. He's been written about in the New York Times and Food and Wine. He was a finalist on The Next Iron Chef, a judge on Chopped and Top Chef. He also appeared on Today, Good Morning America, Martha Stewart, Nightline, and he lives in New York with his wife and two daughters. Now, Marco and I first met on a boat, and <laughs> it true. was called the Summit Boat, and uh, it was a bunch of creatives, entrepreneurs, amazing people, and he had a big stand of this Brodo bone broth. And you had to wait in line for like an hour to get this bone broth, and it was so good. And it was sort of before he really started having his commercial uh, avenue on this, but it was so good, I think it kind of probably inspired him. And it was great to connect with him. We were on a panel together talking about health and wellness and things that you know are not typical often for traditional chefs. I mean, I remember being at Cana Ranch uh, 20 years ago, and I stood up at a meeting with the chefs, nutritionists, the doctors, the owners, and I said, food is medicine, and we need to focus on that here. And this was a long time ago. And the chefs got up and they go, this is not a effing ho hospital. Mm -hmm. This is a, you know, a spa, and we have to focus on taste. And I'm like, you don't have to give up taste to have great stuff. So um, let's talk a little bit, Marco. Welcome. Thank you. It's uh, great to be here. Let's talk about Hearth, which is this amazing restaurant. And, uh, it, you know, the word hearth or hearth is is about home. It's about real food. It's about cooking. It's just, yep. it's so it's so many great connotations. And again, I've been there a number of times. It's amazing. And he celebrates food in a way that most restaurants don't. And I, I go there and I I look at his menu. Now this menu we're gonna post a link to, but it's pretty it's pretty cool. Uh, and on the back of the menu, I mean the front of the menu is great with all the food, which we'll go over. But <laughs> right. he he talks about some of the principles uh, of what his philosophy is about food: wild fish, uh, getting rid of the high mercury fish. The chef rules. He talks about. We'll get into that having more variety, flavor, color, texture of vegetables, more veggies. He talks about fat has a major food group that we need to be eating more of and the right kinds of fat. He talks about awful. Yes. Now, that's not A-W-F-U-L. It's O-F-F-A-L, which is organs. And we'll talk about why that's important. It sounds a little weird, but it's actually amazing. He talks about how to eat clean food, how to have food that's sweet but actually good sweets. He talks about how to have grains that are freshly milled and organic and why organic isn't the only thing we should be focused on. So it's really an amazing education about the quality of the nature and the importance of the food we eat and how it contributes not just flavor, taste, community, deliciousness and fun, but also health. Right. So Marco, how did you get this vision for this restaurant <laughs> about food as medicine and food as celebration and all those things put together in an amazing sure. way. Sure. Well, thank you for that introduction. Um, you know, Hearth, we celebrated our 15th year this year, mm. so that's pretty cool. So Hearth has been a work in progress and has obviously evolved over the years. Uh, a couple years ago, I really wanted to kind of shift our focus and like scream a little louder out the rafters. Um, I wanted it to align more with Brodo and the ethos that kind of spawned Brodo. Um, so, you know, the, the big, the big idea is, listen, like, of course I'm a chef and of course I care about 
the way the food looks and the way the food tastes and the way the food smells, mm -hmm. because that is so critical, right? Like, um, and, and, but the thing that I think we often forget about is what we call our fourth rule, which is it should make you feel good. Uh -huh. So I can't tell you how many times through my 25 years of living in New York city and, and dining out where at the end of a meal, you don't feel good. <laughs> right. You feel like it might have tasted good and you yeah. might have enjoyed your time with your, you know, your mate or your loved one. But at the end of the day, it's like you left and you were kind of holding your gut and maybe you yeah. ate too much or you were eating, you know, highly processed oils. And and I was really surprised at the fact that I could walk the aisles of a supermarket and learn so much more about my food choices than I do when I am navigating a menu in a restaurant in, a, in an urban center. So I really wanted to kind of um, put forth all the ideas that drive our our food purchasing decisions in our mm -hmm. restaurant mm. and you know that infographic that you referred to so awesome. uh, it's a it was can you it, find it online yeah it's online at where? Uh, uh, hearthrestaurant.com hearthrestaurant.com um, okay, but it took it me it was so much editing right because you go fall down rabbit holes and there's so much you want to say so it really it was like eight months in the making to distill it down to these little three sentence sound bites mm -hmm. um, and everybody was like it's way too long it's way too long and i was like i can't say it any less no it's so good um, i mean so yeah it's really fun people respond to it you know i think you know we often focus on all the bad things going on in our food mm -hmm. system agricultural mm -hmm. system health system etc um, but i really think that we're living in an amazing time right now and you know, what you're doing and what so many great people are doing out there and the awareness around food and the importance of food and the notion of food as medicine, um, which I like to say food is medicine that tastes good, Yeah, which is not very common in the medicine world. Um, no. So, you know, I'm, I'm super thrilled to be kind of in, in the current kind of state of the world right now in this country. So when you go to your restaurant, you get not only delighted and excited and stimulated by the food, you're also getting healed at the same time. So people often think that food is good for you, has to taste bad. You know, yeah. Pepsi had this whole campaign of food that's fun for you and food that's good for you. Right. The fun for you food makes you sick and the good yep. for you food, I don't know, but it's, a, it's sort of a false dichotomy. Right? Yeah, I mean, it's nonsense too. I mean, you know, the more nutrient, you know, I, I believe that the more nutrient dense the food products are, the better they taste. And mm -hmm. if you, and you know, I, I implore everyone to do a little, the only way to know that is to do side by side stuff. And it's really awesome when you get a cauliflower from the green market that was picked yesterday mm -hmm. and taste it next to a cauliflower that maybe it's even organic, but yeah. it's grown in soil that doesn't have nutrients and cook them side by side and taste them side by side. And you will see that the nutrient dense product tastes better, smells better, performs better when you cook it than you know, the, the mono crop yeah, organic it's true. Right. cauliflower. And there's industrial organic. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And they it may have any, even be bad for the environment and climate. So you could think you're eating, being a vegan and eating a healthy organic vegetable diet, exactly. but if they grow it through methods that use tilling that right. are intensive in terms of water resources, you, you're depleting the soil. You may be contributing to climate change when you're eating your vegetables. So yeah. it's a little more complicated, but it totally is. It's, it's a, it's, it's such a great vision for a restaurant because you're, you're, um, introducing people to a way of eating that is community based. I mean, the, the dishes are all basically family style. Yep. They're meant to be shared. They're incredibly delicious. I mean, and you've got some kind of weird things on your menu, like variety burger. <laughs> yeah, you've got uh, very, very interesting things like awful food, right? You've got organ meats and mm -hmm. you've got liver and things that uh, typically people sort of steer away from. So let's let's talk about the whole awful thing. Why should we be eating organ meats? It sounds like that's the stuff that everybody throws away. It's right. cheap stuff. It's not really well, part of gourmet cooking. Like, right. Why would you want to use that? So it's funny, the anecdote I use at the back of the menu on the infographic is I look at the jungle and I say, you know, guess what the king of the jungle eats when he takes down an animal that he's going to eat? And it's like the guy that's the highest on the pyramid chooses what he wants first. And guess what he always takes first is the guts. The organs, and, you yeah. know, and it's a pretty compelling argument, I think, because if you look to nature, you know, everybody, we're so obsessed with research science, proving our beliefs. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I like to look other places. I like to look at history and I like to look at nature for my belief system. Yeah. And it's like, 
If the king of the jungle decides that he wants guts first and leaves all the other stuff for everybody else, that's pretty compelling to me. Yeah. I don't need a double blind research study. So, um, and you know, the fascinating research is there. You know, I, I recently saw a spreadsheet of comparison of different vegetables and grains and nutrient dense foods and then liver. And, you know, powerhouse looking food. at just the number and density and amount of nutrients. Com liver compared to the best plant foods on the planet blows it out it's of like the water. tenfold better in terms of nutrient density which is sort of surprising like vitamin c and yeah. antioxidants and the b vitamins and minerals and things that you know you think the are bees especially in right in the liver yeah yep. it's pretty impressive and a, a close second is oysters is my understanding mm. uh super nutrient dense food like the yeah. two most nutrient dense foods beef grass-fed beef liver and oysters yeah so you're not worried about the toxins in the liver? I mean, no, I'm not. <laughs> I mean, if it's grass-fed? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, that's the other thing I really wanted to pose with you is that, you know, one of the things we often, when we talk about health and wellness, we don't qualify things. We want to say low-carb, but we don't want to qualify the carb. And we want to say low-fat, but we don't want to qualify the fat, right? And those things- we say high fat. Or high fat, fat, right? Yeah. And it's like- there, that you know, our, we don't have a lot of time for nuance these days. But the fact of the matter is, is when you're having a conversation around diet or macronutrients or micronutrients, mm -hmm. you need to qualify this yeah. stuff, right? A beef liver isn't a beef liver isn't a beef liver, mm -hmm. and a carb isn't a carb isn't a carb. Um, and you know this this notion of low carb, and I think you mentioned this once before. It's interesting because if you're talking about from a caloric standpoint, low carb is still a lot more carbs and volume than yeah. the fat, right? And yeah. that that's, I, that's I really I say, have such your, empathy. I, I, that's why I say most of your diet should be carbs. Correct. Which and are that's plant foods. Right. And it's counterintuitive. By volume. Right. By volume. But by calories, it exactly. should be fat. And, right. and, you know, it's like I have so much empathy for people because it's like it's really more it's complex. Hard. It's really <laughs> hard, right? So... You know, the fact of the matter is, is like all vegetables are carbs and we need to be eating a lot more vegetables. Mm -hmm. Ask Terry Walls, right? Yeah. Um, Terry Walls was a doctor who reversed her multiple sclerosis yeah. using the power of vegetables. Nine cups of vegetables a day and the phytonutrients and the which colors Which is 18 of servings of vegetables, right. not the five to nine. Right. So it's, it's confusing and I have so much empathy out there and it's like I'm really on a mission to like help people navigate all the weird stuff because it's not that easy. Yeah. You know, you say high fat, low carb. Well, we got to define the carbs and we have to have a qualified conversation around what do you mean? Yeah, and that, and that really speaks to the very foundation of functional medicine, which is the food is information. Right? Correct. So just when you say protein, fat and carbs is meaningless. You could have a pound of trans fat or bunch of omega-3 fats, profoundly different effects on your body. Same thing, you'd have white flour, which is a carb, or you can have broccoli, which is a carb, right. profoundly different effects on your body. Yes. Same thing with protein, the quality of the protein matters, mm -hmm. vegetable protein or animal protein. Yeah, and it's interesting, you know, I've been saying a lot lately since I've been like trying to grow the broth business is that um, there's, everybody understands the notion of good fat, bad fat, because we've been talking about it for a while. Mm -hmm. You know, trans fat, bad you know, olive oil is a good fat. And like, there's a conversation and the same with carbs. Like people understand like highly processed white flour carbs, bad, but slow carbs that are a sweet potato or a broccoli, like people are really getting to know that. that right. Yeah. And it hasn't entered the macronutrient of protein yet. No. And I can't wait for that conversation to start, which is qualifying what a good protein is and qualifying what a bad protein is, because I'm of the belief that Protein powders are simply highly processed foodstuffs. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the one thing I think we all agree on in the health and wellness space is that you should stay away from highly processed shelf-stable foodstuffs mm -hmm. as a general rule. Yeah. Um, and it's just, it's interesting, right? Yeah. Because that's what, and I've heard you mention it on your podcast quite a few times. Like, wait a minute, these are instant. These are industrialized. But could you like, for example, products. dehydrate your bone broth and then add hot water? Like that but, would be okay, right? But the in, or not? I see. There's a lot we don't know. Which, and by I the think, way, is awesome. I'm having some right now. <laughs> thank you. You know, I think one of the things that everybody needs to feel more comfortable with is we don't know a lot. Mm -hmm. And you know, I follow a lot of people I respect, like Peter Atia and Chris Kresser, yeah. and all these guys who are like great research 
doctors. Mm, mm. Um, and they all agree, like, we don't really know a lot. I, I, I We tend, know more than we think, though. There is more agreement on things. Right? Than disagreements? Sure. Yeah. I mean, when you um, pair away all the nonsense of extremism and ideology, the basic foundational principles that you even put on your menu here. Right. Eat whole that, foods. Pretty much. Yeah. Hard we to could agree on that. Right. Yeah, for sure. That's why I created the vegan diet, which is essentially a joke between I, I love and it. vegan. Yeah. And it's sort of the same principles like eat real food. If you're going to eat animals, eat these kind of animals. If right. you're going to eat fat, eat these kinds of fats. If you're going to, you know, we should be eating mostly plants, not plant based, plant rich, I call it plant rich diet. Right. The vegan thing is tricky too because, like, you know, guess what? Soda's vegan. <laughs> it's true. Chips and soda vegan. And so is a donut. And so is like so many yeah. things are vegan. I mean, it's, I think you can so. do it. It's just tough to do it right. And I think, um, you know, I've seen over decades many patients and tested extensively their metabolic nutritional status. And I can say, you know, unequivocally that, you know, vegans and often vegetarians are nutritionally, nutritionally depleted. Yeah, uh, deficient. They're, they're deficient, and it's it. You, I think you can do it well, but it's not easy, and it's the default for what you eat is is often a problem. Where do you get your B vitamins as a vegan? From a p bottle of pills. Oh, got it. <laughs> you know, okay, from B twelve. You have to supplement. You have. I mean, you, you know, vitamin D, omega three fats. Uh, you know, vitamin B twelve. These are things that are very tough, and there are other nutrients that get depleted, like choline and. Um, you know, selenium and iodine. And I mean, these are tough to get. Mm -hmm. I mean, iodine is, you have to supplement to get them in some seaweed, you know, you can get in fish, but they have to supplement. Mm. Yeah. So, um, let's talk about bone broth. Okay. Because, you know, it's this happy to thing, <laughs> like, kind of fatty thing, like not fatty, but right. like fat ish, uh, the D. Into bone broth and collagen. Uh, it's the next best thing. Everybody's, mm -hmm. you know, saying it does all these magical properties like yeah. heal your gut and improve your muscle mass and protein. Um, first of all, all I have to say is that Brodo bone broth tastes great, which is what I care about. I don't want to eat That's... stuff that tastes awful. It's delicious. And you kind of make it in a very unique way that I'd love you to share about and mm. what the ingredients you use are and sure. how you sort of create. And you create this cookbook, which is a whole bone broth cookbook which i encourage everybody to get because it's pretty awesome <laughs> it's called marco canora brodo a bone broth cookbook and i'm just looking through it and you've got such creative things here chicken bone broth fish bone broth grass-fed beef bone broth putting in vegetables different spices really creating food as medicine yeah that tastes great question. it doesn't taste like medicine <laughs> yeah back back to this notion of you know research and what have you you know my belief is that uh why I believe that this is truly a, a, a great restorative elixir is because it's been on every corner of the globe for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. It's not a new thing. It's not a new thing at all. So like to me, again, like I, I, I don't need a double blind research study to tell me that this is a good thing to ingest on the daily. Um, there's been people around the world doing it for centuries, and that's pretty cool. They Whether call it's bone broth Chinese call it. medicine or Ayurvedic medicine or, you know, so many cultures have long, long histories of traditional broth making. Yeah. Um, and and, you know, and when you want to talk about food waste, it's like 30 percent of a grass fed cow is bone. Um, so we need to utilize those bones. We need to get those nutrients out of those bones and mm. put them in this delicious broth that, by the way, is the forgotten staple in your kitchen. I like to say salt, pepper, fat water and broth are the things you need in your kitchen to become a great cook. Yeah. And I know you believe in cooking as much as I do. Yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, th there's a lot of debate around, is it stock? Is it broth? Is it, and it's like, I kind of, my response is like, call it whatever you want. Mm -hmm. You know, you boil, you boil clean bone, uh, you know, bones from clean animals, uh, for a long time and you get all of the, you know, the connective tissue to release all of its goodness into the broth. And you end up with like a nutrient dense filled with umami with the glutamate, right? It's like, I say it's the natural MSG because there's yeah. a lot of glutamate in there. Yeah. The G of MSG. Um, and it, it like, it makes everything taste good, whether you cook rice in it or cook quinoa in it or mm. deglaze a vegetable or deglaze a pan with it. Mm. Um, so, you know, there's nothing, you know, it's interesting, like with Brodo or broth shops, it's like, we have 
one foot in the tradition of it because it's been around forever mm. and then we have another foot in the fun innovative part yeah. because you know if you put it in a coffee cup with a sip lid and you start adding things and customizing <laughs> those things um with other powerful food stuffs like, like ginger, ginger and, and garlic and turmeric and fat um you really it's like an amazing palate you even right? have a bone marrow bone broth Yep, we buzz the grass-fed bone marrow into it, and then we do barbecue spice bone marrow into the beef broth, and it tastes like you're drinking, like, barbecue. Um, <laughs> and it's kind of endless how much you could do and how tasty it is. Yeah. And by the way, it doesn't have 50 grams of sugar the way a lot of these uh, sweet coffee beverages have. And a large broth has 20 grams of protein. Yeah, so let's, let's uh, so, talk about what's in it because it seems all mysterious. You know, you take these bones, you throw them in yeah, water. Yeah, it's really not. What do you do? What do you put in it? How do you, what's in these bones? Right. And what does it do for you? So I like to use a variety of bones, right? So, you know, I, I believe that a lot of the collagen exists in the connective tissue. So I love to use feet. I love to use knuckles. I really love to use neck. And what's cool about the neck bone is it's hard to get all the meat off of it. And you want some meaty bones because the meat is where the flavor is. Mm. Um, and I think a lot of people go out and they buy marrow bones, which are femur bones. And it's very easy to strip the meat off of a femur bone. So a lot of people are at home making stock with a bunch of clean white bones. Um, and then they're like, God, this tastes awful. And it's like, well, of course. With some bone marrow in yeah, it, maybe. Yeah, but of course it tastes awful because... It's just bone. Like you need meat, you need vegetables, a little tomato product, some pepper, some bay leaf. You know, it's like, it's a thing making broth, it's right? more just, it's more bone soup than bone. Right. And I think we're so obsessed with function, right? It's like I went to Expo East this year and it's like everything is so function based, function, 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 where it's like the name of the thing is, you know, based on the function of the thing. And it's like... You know, let's not forget that it needs to taste good or there's going to be no adherence, yeah. right? Like, as you know, one of the most difficult things is for people to adhere to the program. And I tell you mm -hmm. what, it's going to be very easy to adhere to the idea of drinking a cup of broth every day. Yeah. Um, and that's important. And that's to the point of making food taste good with the healthy ingredients. It's like you have, to, you know, food is absolutely medicine, but it's our job as chefs and doctors to figure out a way to make it taste good so that people have adherence to this new discipline of cooking for yourself, eating healthy foods. So the shocking thing you just said was that bone broth, like a cup of bone broth has 20 grams of protein. Yep. Our 16 ounce cup of beef broth or hearth broth, 20 grams of protein. So you know, all these protein and then we put an egg yolk in it too, by the way, you, you whip an egg yolk into that thing, add some like, um, nutmeg and cinnamon. And yeah. it's like, you have a broth based eggnog that is oh. like to die for. Wow, so that's an amazing amount of protein. Yeah. And it's not just like any protein, right? It's got it's some bioavailable protein, I think, that your body understands, right? I mean, it's, it's unique protein and has different amino acids than, let's say, you'd get from beans or grains, right? Right. Solu it's a soluble protein, too. Yeah. And uh, very high in glycine, arginine, glutamine, proline. Um, and if you look at research science, there actually is a bunch of studies around these component parts and these particular amino acids that are purported to do all kinds of things from, you know, helping the mucosal lining of your gut or uh, building stronger tendons or building yeah. more muscle yeah. or, you know, glycine is even purported to help you sleep better because yeah. it's like a GABA thing and it like, it helps calm your brain. Um, it's also important for detoxification and building yeah, glutathione. glutathione. Exactly. So boy, us, us stressed out New Yorkers, we could use a little bit of all that stuff, right? Yeah, you know, it's interesting when you drink it, uh, you just have this sense that you're doing something really awesome for yeah. your taste buds and your body. It's really energizing. Yeah, I find and it like calming and it's got some interesting like magical property. I don't know what it is, but every time I drink it, I'm like, yeah. oh, I feel so good. You know? And I'll tell you anecdotally, being at being at the window or being in my shops, it's like the customer feedback yeah. is just, if I ever get down at the struggle of growing a small, uh, growing a, a, a upstart business, I just go and spend a couple hours in my shop yeah. Because seven out of 10 people who walk into the shop are just filled with like all these unbelievable stories. Just before I got here, a woman was like, you know, I've had gastrointestinal problems for years and years. And ever since I've started coming here and I drink it every day and like it's totally gone. And it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, glutamine this, is so important for repairing your gut. Exactly. And it's one of the key amino acids in there.
And it's like this notion of N equal one study, you know, it's like if it were, you know, everybody is complex, right? And, and it's, it's like, if it works for you, then it works for you. And I got to tell you, I hear time and time again, day after day for three years now, how this really helps people yes. and it, it drives our whole company um, because it's really exciting. Now, can you just get it in New York or do you guys sell it online or? So we sell it online, both coasts, free two day shipping uh, through e-commerce. And does it come like cold or? Yep, it comes in this in this awesome box uh, with some um, insulation that you run underwater and it goes down the drain. So it's like super eco-friendly mm. insulation that so we're need, really proud of. You need a factory in uh, Iowa so you can get to the whole country. Exactly, <laughs> that's, that's coming, we're getting there. Um, but we really believe in shops, you know. Two of our shops are pretty close to Starbucks and you know, we don't aspire to have 18,000 Brodos, but you know, we like to say for every 50 Starbucks, there could be a Brodo broth shop. Um, it's certainly, uh, it's certainly when you look at them side by side, you know, it's, it's really no contest in terms of the, the nutrient value, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there's no sugar, there's a lot of protein, it's low in calorie. Um, there's no dairy, there's no gluten. It's like an allergen free food. Um, so it's got a lot going for it. And most importantly, as you said, it tastes really, really good. And it connects to this whole idea of food waste, right? Well, yeah, you, you mentioned, you know, 30 percent of a cow is bone bone and, and you know, other for, animals, probably about the same ratio. So right. we just what do we do with them normally we throw them out? Well, for a long time, they were it wasn't worth the time and energy. I mean, now that now that this country seems to be somewhat obsessed over bone broth, you know, that's changing the game a little mm -hmm. bit in terms of, uh, you know, what you used to be able to get bones for yeah. seven years ago yeah. compared to now it's yeah. changed. But like that's certainly uh, a better model, right? To mm. use to get people using these bones and getting more nutrient value out of them. The problem is, is like the vast majority of our our uh, supply chain now is still commodities beef. Yeah. Um, which you know, as you know, there's a lot of problems with that. So, you know, as a chef, uh, you know, it seems a little bit out of your wheelhouse to be focused on things like sustainability and climate and the environment and even nutrition. I mean, as a chef, it's not something most chefs focus on. It was yeah. taste and flavor. And uh, and yet this is really the, the core of who you are and what you do, which is, is amazing. Now, in your world of chefs, is this is this a trend? Is this a movement? Are, are more and more chefs caring about this? Certainly, um, there's more and more awareness ar around all those buckets you mentioned. Um, I was really surprised. We did the whole the nutrient dense forward menu concept a couple, three years ago at Hearth. And I was really surprised, frankly, that there hasn't been more people doing that. I mean, that's not to say that there's it actually happens more in the fast casual world where there's this fo focus on function yeah. and nutrient density. Um, whether it's a salad concept or like Sweet a quick, or, yeah, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of it happening in the fast casual world, a lot more so than in the more fine dining world. And, you know, that's fine with me because I feel like we're like standing out on an island a little bit um, in a very competitive climate that is Manhattan. Um, so I'm very happy that there aren't a lot of followers, but I am surprised by the fact that there aren't more chefs out there in the fine dining world kind of talking about um, the choices they're making as it relates to nutrient density mm. and nutrition. Mm. Because, you know, a freshly milled grain is very different than a flour that yeah. you buy and, and all the things that we talk about, right? Um, they're all but pretty there are important. There's guys like Dan Barber and David Boulay. Oh my God, these guys. Got Anthony Mint, you know, Anthony Mint, who's... Boulay and Barber, I mean, they're amazing. Dan yeah. is, the stuff he's doing with seeds and like he's just one of the most brilliant chefs uh, in the world. Yeah. So... Um, is it so it is it's certainly trend. happening. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. in general, people's awareness around food and the power of food is just, and that's why I said to you earlier, it's so exciting to be part of, you know, you all like that. Want this, oh like my God. The energy around it is like so mm -hmm. real and palpable. And I feel it every day in the shop and every, every night in, in my dining room, like people want it. People are conscious. People are reading labels more. Um, and they just, you know, the big thing is we have to convince them they have to spend more money on food. Yeah. Like that's the big hurdle. It's well, like. Well, you think about it, in the United States, we spend probably 9% of our income on food. In right. Europe, it's 20%. Right. In some countries, it's 50%. Yep. 
Uh, we don't prioritize it. We'd rather buy our fancy stuff, or have our flat screen TVs or computer, whatever. And we it give is. up so much for convenience too. Yeah. You know, I've heard you say that before. It's like convenience comes at a cost to our health, mm -hmm. and we have to start realizing that. Um, and also, it's like infrastructure has to change, right? Our distribution system is not built for fresh food. Our food manufacturing system is not built for fresh food. Our agricultural system is not built for nutrient dense fresh food. I mean, it's you look at, yeah, you look at the farm bill, right? How much is going to the other category, which is like well, all the, the things we should a, be the eating. The farm bill is a joke because yeah. it's not really a farm bill. It's, it's a, a food stamp bill, correct. which is about 75% of the trillion dollars, which is no doubt three quarters of a trillion dollars is spent on food stamps, which is important for the poor. But most of that is spent on highly processed junk food and 10% of it is spent on soda alone. Yeah, it's scary. Yeah, it is. These scary. numbers are insane. Yeah. So, um, what what about the food waste issue? Because uh, you know, I, you know, Dan Barber has this really cool thing where he makes these amazing meals out of food scraps. You've got companies like Imperfect, which are taking all the ugly food and misshapen, mm -hmm. miscolored things that get thrown in the landfills that creates methane and climate change. Forty percent of our food is wasted. So I know. It's what's your view on this whole? Food waste really issue and how do we do it? And how do you how do you work with it in your in your restaurant? Um, it's obviously a very complicated issue. Uh, a lot of people um, want to kind of like force this idea of it's elitist to say this or think that. But like one of my beliefs is we need to spend more money on food. And once you start spending more money on food, you have more focus and attention to get the most out of the food. Mm -hmm. And I understand that the zip code drives like the people who need it the most. And yeah. that's true. But, um, you know, I think part of the problem is we're producing so much cheap food that, uh, it's, it's pretty easy to throw it away because you don't perceive a lot of value. It's like, you know, it's, it, you could, you could liken it to anything. Like you buy the great leather jacket that you spend a lot of money on and you take care of it and you have it for 25 years of your adult life, right? Or you yeah. could just buy like crappy leather jackets and buy 15 of them. Yeah. I think that there's a, an interesting conversation around, uh, and I saw it happen at Hearth when we decided to like shift everything to like a better version of the thing. Yeah. One of the big conversations I had with my cooks early on was like, listen, we're only getting grass fed butter right now. So guess what? You better be really careful about where you use it, what you're basting with it. Don't put too much. And like you, you create more attention and you put more value on things. Um, and then you're going to waste less of them. Mm -hmm. I think part of our problem with food waste is we're producing so much bad food, mm. <laughs> and, you know? Yeah. And I, you know, I think, uh, it's something we aren't really aware of, but you know, it sort of links to also food waste that happens, not just on the farms or in, in restaurants or grocery stores, but even in the home. And, it, yeah. and you know, I, I think, how do we, how do we sort of get people inspired about cooking? Because as a chef, that's your it's life, huge. that's what you do, is what you care about. But, and we, yes, we want people to eat at your restaurants and buy your bone broth, but at the end of the day, most of the time, most of the people have to learn how to cook at home. And it's such an obstacle for people. I think it takes too much time. Right. It's expensive. It's difficult. It's hard. How do you break through that? <clears throat> you know, so much, every, so many things boil down to education, right? And like one of the things around food waste is people have to understand, and I learned a lot in the past couple of years growing uh, the broth company, but it's like you have to understand why things spoil mm -hmm. and, and then what to do to mitigate against that spoilage, right? And it's like... Things like, you know, acidity levels and water content. These are all things you look at that, that, you know, add to shelf life or take shelf life away. Right. And just learning and educating yourself around some simple traditional preserving techniques, whether it is cover it in vinegar or put it in the oven overnight at 180 degrees and dehydrate all the water out of it. If, if, you know, if you have some beets that are going bad, well, like slice them up and put them in the oven overnight at 180 and you're going to get the water out and you're going to dehydrate them. And you're going to have this cool little beet gummy bear that you could, that'll have, yeah. you'll extend the shelf life. Yeah. Um, and that you know, good. cooking, <laughs> yeah. Beet gummy bears are amazing. Um, but yeah, I, I agree. Like cooking is such an unbelievable, uh, process that people need to just dive in and learn how to love it. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of the few things we do that engages all of your senses. 
Um, and it's pretty accessible. You know, you don't need a ton of tools or training um, or training. And you have to like cut yourself a break and be a little bit forgiving and start simple. And, you know, um, it's one of those things where it's so important that you need to figure out a way to learn to like it mm -hmm. and learn to deal with like, yes, it means dishes, but it's like, guess what a lot of people do instead of cook, they watch TV and they watch cooking shows. It's like, well, that's true. You Americans know, spend more time watching cooking on yeah, television and actually cooking. Right. And there's such a payoff, right? There's such a payoff to your health. There's a payoff to your palate. Mm -hmm. um, there could be a great payoff to your pocketbook. You know, like the idea of learning how to buy whole chickens mm -hmm. and breaking down those chickens and using the parts and making broth. It's like there's it, it's really. Um, yeah, Mark a, Pittman wrote an article about that, how you can eat a meal for a family of four <clears> with <throat> chicken and salad, some basic food. Cheaper than you can go for McDonald's for a family <clears> of four. <throat> there's so. Yeah, exactly. There's so much benefit from learning how to cook um, that. You know, it's it's our job to encourage it. And frankly, like we need to bring home economics back into our schools. Yeah. Right. Because we need to teach kids from a young age. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm trying to pitch this idea of like the electric company of cooking and nutrition uh, and health. Right. So that there's a chef and there's a farmer and there's a nutritionist like yourself. And it's like it's just like electric company. And there's all these fun and colorful things around growing food and cooking food. And why? Um, because there's too many children out there that have no, no idea clue, yeah. and we need to, we need to change it from the ground up. And that means bringing home ec back. Yeah. Well, that wasn't an accident that it disappeared. It was a design yeah. of the food industry that subverted it and invented a woman named Betty Crocker, which I've talked about on the show who it's basically I thought was real. My mother had the Betty Crocker cookbook. You've probably seen it. And there was a woman named Betty who was a home ec teacher that was promoting families growing gardens and learning how to cook and, having it's meals so together and they were like, this is dangerous to our convenience culture. We need to shift that and get rid of home ec and take over the kitchens of America. And well, I, I think the thing about people don't realize about cooking is that it's, it's modular and that if you understand the building blocks of how to cook food, you need to have knife skills and how to chop stuff. You yep. need to know how to saute, how to roast, how to bake, how to, what, what timing you need for different foods so they come out at the same Absolutely. time. You don't want to like stir fry vegetables and then cook your meat, which is going to mean your right. vegetables are soggy and yeah. dead after. Sure. So it's really some basic modular, simple skills that yeah. are kind of lost. It's a lost art. And Agreed. I think if you teach people those simple things, then they, you know, they can use recipes, but they don't necessarily need them. They can just make simple food. And I, I can make dinner in much quicker time than I can go to a restaurant, order the meal, and eat it no doubt about it and save yourself a lot of money yes and it's probably going to be better for you because you're going to use you know likely you're going to use a better oil and you're going to get something at the green market and obviously not everyone has access to the things that we have access to living in new york yeah um but still like you know so, sh shop shop in the produce section no matter where you are well yeah. some some areas of the country don't have a produce section for hundreds hard. of it miles can, it definitely can be hard um, i mean i used to live in a small town in idaho with 3500 people uh, i think you know there were people there who probably never ate a vegetable in their life the produce section was as big as my dining room table which right. is not very big and most of it was kind of gross but yep. we figured out how to use the stuff that was there we sometimes we'd drive 50 miles to the next town to you know, go to Costco or Trader Joe's or somewhere where they had cheaper, healthier food. And, and there's a way to do it. And the world of e-commerce, especially, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now you, you know, all the blue apron type, you know, companies, it's like you get stuff delivered right to your door. Yeah, so amazing. So, um, how do you, uh, look at your restaurant in terms of the experience you want to create for people? Because I've been there and one of the things that really was powerful, it was symbolic and it was meaningful was you had this little box on the table yeah so tell us about this i love the boxes box on the table what is it there for why do you, why do you have it and tell us about it. you why know you started it well <clears throat> four or five years ago i started noticing how to how insane it was the people in their phones right and it was just like it was to the point where i would walk through the dining room and i just could not get over how extreme it was right and like not many people get that angle of like being in a dining room with 80 people to really see it. I mean, you see it walk in the streets, but I was privy to seeing 80 people at once. 
And when I tell you, and by the way, in a place where people come to connect with each other. Yeah, exactly. And when I tell you that 60 to 70% of them were not connecting with each other and they were all like embedded their heads into their uh, phones, whether it was a couple or a family or whatever. And it was insane. And we started as a, as a the group of managers at Hearth, we started talking about it and we, we, we wanted to figure out a way to do it that was kind of chill and low key and not dogmatic and wouldn't create complexities. And we were like, maybe we could ask them to check it like a coat. Um, and then we were like, no, then we're responsible for these $800 things. And like, that doesn't work. And we debated for literally, <laughs> we debated for like 18 months how to execute in a way that would be super easy and not really require dialogue. Cause I really can't stand preaching di and dialogue like servers having dialogue table side at a restaurant is a pet peeve of mine. And it's like, and you want them to talk to the customer. Well, it's like, you need to be, you need to be prepared to answer any question that a customer asks, but they're there to be with their guest. And like, it's just so annoying when they go on and like when the, when the table side server diatribe goes on and on and on, I find that very intrusive and annoying. Mm -hmm. So we're very conscious of that. Like we're there and we want to be attentive and we want to provide great service. And we're obviously educated and informed to answer any question you may have, yeah. but we're not just going to like spew out stuff. Like you need to ask. Yeah. Um, so I didn't want there to be like this thing on the table. Like if you want to put your phone away, like you'll get a free drink or whatever. And we didn't want to do that. So we finally came up with this idea of, you know what? Let's find some cool old cigar boxes online. Mm -hmm. Let's put a note on top that says open me. And then inside it says, we would like to invite you to put your phone in the box and be present with your guest. And yeah. that's it. Yeah. And you know what? Everybody sits at the table and there's like a knife and a fork and a napkin and a, you know, the, the standard tabletop stuff. And then there's this cool, colorful box and it says, open me. So it's like, we don't have to do anything. Like the box does everything. That's awesome. And, and so do it's, people a, use it? it's amazing. Like for one, there's always a conversation around it, which is great because people start talking about it. I would say seven out of 10 people are like, they light up and they're excited and they throw their phone in the box and it's fantastic. Eight out of 10 people. Seven, eight out of 10 people to use it. Um, so it's fantastic. And like, you know, guys like you in the functional medicine world, and if you look at the whole blue zone concept, one of the things that I believe never gets enough play in terms of like the holistic view on what it means for health and wellness mm. is the notion of like connection and community, right? And how, what a vital role that plays into one's psychological health and physical health and I think that when you look at the blue zones, one of the things they all really oh, have sure. that we don't it's have much of is community and connection and gathering around a table and having a ritualistic meal together. Mm -hmm. And like, I really believe that that is so critical to your health. Um, so the fact that people put away their, their phones at a restaurant and actually and you see they become more animated. They actually start looking at each other in the eye and they're engaging. And like, I really think that that is as important as the, the healthy foods that we're, we're, you know, preparing and putting on a plate for Absolutely. these folks. And by the way, if you eat the best quality food and you're stressed and disconnected right. from your body, your Forget digestion it. can't work, you can't absorb exactly. the nutrients. They've actually studied this. You literally don't absorb the nutrients because if you're stressed, you don't want to be absorbing food. You want to be running from a tiger, right? Right. So it's powerful. So, you know, your restaurant does that in so many ways. One, just the name of it. Let's gather around. The hearth, right. right? The center of the two, home. Yeah. Two, the shared plates. So you're eating in community. Yep. You Passing know, things. You can't just be on your phone and eat your food because it's going to be gone if you don't look up. Right. And you've got this beautiful box, which yep. inspires people to sort of stop for a minute and think about yep. the we, quality we were, of their experience. Yeah, we were super excited when we landed on how to do it. And then we launched it and the feedback was great. And, and yeah, it's really special. I love it. Yeah, I, I think everybody should get a box for their home. And a lot of people have, yeah, and, and they're think, starting you know, to do that. Right. When people come, uh, you know, to my house for dinner, I'll often say, you know, here's a basket, put yeah, your phone put in, put it away. Let's just be here. My like, God. And, and, and I, I, for my wife, I, I told this story many times, but for our anniversary, I gave her a box and she's like, Oh, that's a nice little box. I'm like, no, that's not the present. The present is I put my box in the, my phone in the box for the weekend. <laughs> right. And you I'm get, all yours. Yeah. What a great gift. Like, 
such a gift that we we can it really give is. each other that is more valuable than anything especially if you have children or you know your family or yeah your wife i mean it's so valuable to like put down your phone and be with whoever it is you're mm-hmm. going to be with even in, in a you know business meetings as well it's like you know it's like I'm here to yeah. engage with another human, and it's like yeah. we're kind of we're we're kind of losing our we're losing our skills, yeah. um, and it's pretty frightening. So it's great at Cleveland Clinic. We have our staff meetings, and everybody puts their phone on the table, so important in the front of the room, yeah. and then nobody touches them, and everybody's yeah. present. It's just awesome. Yeah, a real productive meeting, yeah. right? So, Marco, if you were king for a day and you could change something in our landscape of food and health, what would it be? Can I have more than one? You can have as many things as you want. Oh, you, really? You, oh, God. We'll you're be here king. all day. You can make as many decrees. <laughs> we'll be here all day. You can make as many day. laws. You can change everything. We'll be here all day. Um, so let's see. Uh, one of the things I would do is I would have a better, um, I'd put something in place around the process of making foods. So, you know, if you look at our packaged food world and our supermarket world, um, there's so much uh, oversight around ingredient panels, mm. and there's so much oversight around nutritional facts panels, and the, not the, necessarily the right kind, but yes, correct, <laughs> correct. But you know, the thing that they never that they're never transparent about is the process, and I think there's pro I think there's problems in in process, right? And I think that I, as a consumer, I want I have the right to know the way in which you're doing the food because yeah, the origin of it and also the process by which you're doing it. Because like, you know, I don't know, like if you take a chickpea and you like fill it with air and then dehydrate it and then put it, fry it in some crazy oil and then puff it through some crazy machine. It's like, I want to know about that. Right. And I, I, I'm, I don't buy the fact that like, you know, because it has all the right buttons on it, you know, the, the, the healthy snack food market, like, there needs to be transparency around the process. Yeah, a lot of it's junk. Because right. yeah, so I think that that you know, and, and people need to understand that. And right now we can't because there's nothing that says you have to talk about process. Mm-hmm. So I would I would have a new section on packaged goods that is like the process section. You know, there there is a there is an environmental working group, uh, food score, app where oh, you can actually put in and scan any processed food, and it will tell you. The degree of processing, all those things. Well, really? Yeah, it's very. That's cool. amazing. The quality of the nutrition. I'm going to get that the immediately. Of processing, and uh, you know whether there's any weird bad stuff in it. It's actually interesting. Right. So, so that's that's one. Yeah. Um, another we're, one is the research. <laughs> the, the research science in this country, yeah. I think, is flawed, and yeah. I think you know nutrition. Research? Peter Atia, yeah, nutrition research, and you know, uh, Peter Atia and I think Gary Taubes were doing this thing called NUSI, and they, and basically the premise was you know what, we need to do research that is independently uh, financed, right? So that it's like, if you, you know, research science today is, is funded, it requires a lot of money and it's funded by the people with, you know, big food and they want it to say something. So if you follow the money, you usually find that yeah. you, the research is kind of flawed, yeah, right? Eight, eight to 50 times more likely to find a positive outcome for a study if it's funded by a food industry company right. versus an independent researcher. So I feel like third parties need to fund uh, in this country. And I think if that happened, there'd be more, um, there'd be better research. Philanthropy and even the yes. NIH, the government has to fund the right exactly. research. Exactly. So I would change the way in which we do research in this country. And then the other big one for me is like, uh, I would change the cafeteria systems and hospitals because it's it's just so disturbing to think that the sick people in our country that are in beds and hospitals are being fed what they're being fed. It's absolutely true. Um, and it's just like, it's so problematic on so many levels because these are the experts. These are where we go. Like we have trust in that system and doctors and they're the people that take care of us. And then they bring up the tray of food and it's like a packaged drink that has like you know, protein, it's just, it's, you know what's happening it's Franken food. It's like the hospital is serving Franken food. Do you know what's happening at Lenox Hill Hospital in New York? They've got a bunch of chefs together creating delicious meals. Right. About 20 to 30% of the food was wasted because people don't want to eat it. Now everybody's eating the food. It's delicious. Yep. It's transforming the system. So there needs to be more of that, right? Like, so I would put huge focus on that and I would make sure that, you know, I would just, I would accelerate that mission because it's true. It's starting to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, 
it just needs to be happening a yeah. whole lot more. Yeah. Uh, we need to, they need to understand that they need to spend more money on food. Mm -hmm. So good. So those are three things. It's great. And by the way, I just came <laughs> back from Abu Dhabi. Yeah. Uh, and the Cleveland Clinic has a center there. Uh, and I've been working with a team at Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland to reform the food in the hospitals. We're all over it. Mm. The challenge is working with these big food service companies like Sodexo, Aramark. It's very hard. And it's very tough. They, they say Margin, the right margin, things. margin. Right. And it's very tough. So in Abu Dhabi, it's amazing. It's a more of an autocratic system and there's less bureaucracy and yep. the alignment of incentives are all there. And the CEO of the hospital says, no more white, no more white flour, no more white sugar, no more white exactly. rice, potatoes, all this stuff that's starchy and is making people sick, out. Yep. And only good food in, organic. All the food in the hospital is organic. It's unbelievable. It's such a no-brainer though, right? But it's it's like, it's how is it possible? World almost. How is it possible yeah. that that's not happening faster? It's so great. It's really well, a shame. These are all inspiring ideas. Uh, this has been a great conversation. Thanks. Thank you for being on the Doctor's Pharmacy, Marco, and uh, talking about things that really matter. You've been listening to Doctor's Pharmacy with Marco Canora, the founder of Hearth Restaurant, the author of Brodo, a bone broth cookbook, many other cookbooks. Check out his restaurants, his site, get some bone broth. And <laughs> Thanks, uh, if you like this podcast, please leave a review. We'd love to hear from you. Sign up for this and subscribe wherever you find your podcasts on Google Play, iTunes, wherever. And if you liked it, share it with your friends and family. And we'll see you next time on The Doctor's Pharmacy for another conversation that matters.